did this former Soviet Republic just witness its third revolution? The disputed vote triggered days of unrest in Bishkek. Is this a case of legitimate public anger or are there criminal elements and possibly larger geopolitical pressures at play? I'm Ali Hassan and today's newsmaker is the political upheaval in Kyrgyzstan. A recent election, widely seen as fraudulent, triggered a crisis that now sees Kyrgyzstan under a state of emergency with a political situation that's been changing by the minute. A convicted kidnapper released from prison just days ago has been confirmed as the country's new prime minister. That's after his appointment was initially rejected by the president. Will this resolve the problems that drove people onto the streets in the first place? Or does it usher in a whole new level of uncertainty as he pressures the president to step down? Natalie Pahonen reports. There's a saying that a week is a long time in politics. The Central Asian state of Kyrgyzstan appears to have turbocharged the maxim. A contested ballot, protests, the jailbreak of a former president and a state of emergency. These are just some of the events that have thrust the nation into the global spotlight since the parliamentary elections on October 4. 16 parties were running, but only four passed the threshold to secure seats. Two parties allied with President Surumbay Jiembekov won the majority of votes. Supporters of opposition parties disputed those results. There were also claims of widespread vote buying. Demonstrators came out in the capital, Bishkek, to call for a new election and to denounce corruption in politics. People came here to change injustice. We want to live in a fair democratic state where legislation is working and people are equal. Authorities shouldn't usurp the power in their hands. Protesters entered the White House, home to the parliament and presidential offices, and took their frustrations out on this portrait of the president. Election officials have annulled the ballot and a fresh vote is due to take place in November. But the political instability remains, with different factions vying for power. Jiembekov offered to resign once a new cabinet is installed and law and order is restored. He says there's a real threat to the existence of the state. The parliament has appointed a new prime minister, Zadar Japarov. The convicted kidnapper was sprung from jail in the chaos that followed the contested elections. After gaining a deep understanding of the political situation in the country, everyone has taken a step toward returning to legality and deciding to stabilize the present situation in adherence with the law. On Wednesday, Parliament once again approved his nomination after the president asked for a new vote. There doesn't appear to be an obvious path out of this crisis. There's also concern from key ally Russia about what happens here. President Vladimir Putin sent a top aide to Bishkek this week for talks with Jambikov and Japarov. People power has history in Kyrgyzstan. There were popular uprisings in 2005 and 2010 that saw presidents removed from office. The appetite for political change in 2020 is clear, but how it's achieved remains unpredictable. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from the capital Bishkek is Joanna Lillis. She's a freelance journalist who's covered Central Asia for decades. Also in Bishkek is Peter Leonard. He's the Central Asia editor at Eurasia Net. And in Prague is Bruce Penier. He's Radio Free Europe Central Asia correspondent. Uh, Joanna, Kyrgyzstan, the country that you're in right now, has been gripped by a political crisis since the disputed parliamentary elections on October 4th, and uh, breaking news are coming in uh, by the minute. It seems now that President Jembekov has approved uh, Zadir Japarov as the new prime minister, who in turn is now asking for the president 
to step down. Uh, what is taking place there on the ground? Uh, indeed. Um, today, uh, Sadia Japarov was approved in another parliamentary vote after uh, previous disputed proceedings. Um, so he was approved as prime minister um, with the uh, at least the tacit um, approval of the president, who's backed into a corner and had to really let that process uh, proceed. Um, but what we're hearing this evening is that they, the two of them have been having talks, Sadia Japarov, the prime minister, as you said, a convicted criminal, a convicted ki kidnapper who was sprung from jail during the post-election unrest, has been having talks with um, the president, uh, Soran Baiji and Bekov. And Mr. Japarov is absolutely insistent that the president should resign. Um, now, um, what we're hearing this um, President Jane Bekov uh, is willing to resign, but only after a rerun of those parliamentary elections, which is not expected really for a couple of months. Um, so, uh, but the, but but uh, Sadia Japarov, the Prime Minister newly installed, is insisting that he should resign. Now, Mr. Um, Japarov's supporters have been out on the streets of Bishkek today, holding a rally, demanding that the president should go. Um, and so, um, uh, that's where we are at the moment. That's where we are this evening in Bishkek, continued tensions, um, you know, a good 10 days after these disputed elections, an ongoing political standoff with the threat of violence hanging in the air. Peter, do you think the approval uh, and appointment of Japarov now as uh, Kyrgyzstan's new prime minister is going to calm things down on the street and soothen the political atmosphere in the country, or is this uh, far from over? Well, that was the initial plan, certainly. I think until this afternoon, we'd uh, sort of uh, labored under the assumption that uh, this was some sort of a, a fudge uh, whereby the uh, president was allowed to stay on and uh, Japara would uh, uh, take over as prime minister. And uh, the Speaker of Parliament, also a new appointee, is from yet another sort of camp. Uh, but now it seems that uh, the latest news is that uh, uh, Japarov is intent on uh, uh, continuing to push for the president's resignation. And, uh, and if he does uh, can insist on that, then it's uh, very possible we may see a continuation of this crisis. So the tale uh, still continues. Uh, Bruce, let's, uh, let's uh, step back here just for one minute and look at how this all started. Kyrgyzstan obviously held a parliamentary election on October 4th, a uh, very disputed one. Uh, protesters went out on the street saying that the vote is rigged, demanding a new vote. And in fact, the Central Election Commission in Kyrgyzstan has annulled the results amid allegations of widespread vo voting violations, a claim that international observers also backed up. Uh, how do we get into this mess in the first place? Well, it was in advance, I mean, there was uh, allegations of vote buying, you know, that went back before the parties even registered or held their con their congresses to uh, name the candidates. So people were expecting that that there would be vote buying. There was also allegations of uh, use of administrative resources. And by that, I would mean that, you know, people that were in the state were, were telling their employees, uh, their subordinates, that they had to vote for a certain party. But um, you know, as much as people expected that there would be a lot of dirty tricks coming up to elections, I, I think that everyone was surprised by the magnitude of it. I mean, it was far beyond the pale. The, the two parties that were accused of, of trying to get out there and manipulate votes ahead of the elections were the ones that took the most amount of votes. And the other parties were even the two that, that squeaked in after them. I mean, barely. They barely got over the 7% threshold. And then 12 were left out entirely. So I think the the reality of just how bad the election was hit everybody when the results were announced. Joanna, interestingly enough, several politicians made bids to become prime minister once the clashes and protests started. It now looks as if Sadr Japarov is going to be the prime minister. As we pointed out in the package and, and, and after, of course, he was serving a prison sentence for taking a hostage. He's a known nationalist. What kind of person? is Japarov? What should the international community know about him? Well, the first thing to know that he is, um, as things stand, a convicted criminal. Um, the crime he was uh, convicted of um, was kidnapping a local official during a previous bout of political turmoil uh, in Kyrgyzstan. That was in 2013. He was having a standoff with some uh, government forces and he kidnapped um, a local governor in order to use him as a bargaining chip. 
Um, now, he was eventually, he fled abroad after that, but he eventually uh, did return to Kyrgyzstan and he was jailed for 11 years um, for that uh, crime. Now, he's also, um, uh, and I just should add that that's the crime he was in jail for, he was in jail for when he was um, released by his supporters during all that turmoil uh, after the election. Um, and he's also a former MP. He's a nationalist um, affiliated to a, a nationalist party that was standing in the election. Um, and, um, you know, there have been reports in the Kyrgyz media that uh, he also has some dubious um, affiliations with uh, organized crime. So uh, the international community, uh, you mentioned, um, obviously taking a rather um, cautious stance at the moment, but we've already seen a statement from the American embassy in Bishkek um, talking about the need to keep uh, corruption and organized crime out of politics. Peter, these events that we've been seeing unfolding in Kyrgyzstan since October 4th are in a way somewhat surprising because Kyrgyzstan is often known and referred to as Central Asia's only democratic country where actually uh, impactful elections are held in a region where leaders usually rule for decades and elections are largely symbolic. Why did this one go off the trail? Yes, although it is uh, Central Asia's only democracy, I mean, that's a relative term, of course. Um, as uh, uh, my colleague uh, Bruce was uh, explaining, um, a couple of parties were expected to um, uh, take a firm advantage in these elections. Um, uh, and they did, except I think perhaps more than uh, was um, expected by pundits uh, uh, ahead of the election itself. Um, and I think what's important to understand here is that unlike a lot of uh, very rigid authoritarian countries where it's just uh, one party that uh, you know takes all the prize here what you have going on is you know one party that was very close to the president another party that was close to this very kind of shadowy corrupt figure who said to um, fund a lot of uh, opposition activity um, a lot of political activity uh, in the country and so um, you know, it, it's a it, it's a slightly different picture from uh, a standard authoritarian country where it's just you know that the ruling party takes all, but it's also a very different picture from you know a healthy democratic system where it's people kind of vying uh, for you know the primacy in parliament on the basis of uh, the best ideas and policies. Kyrgyzstan uh, democracy by Central Asian standards. Uh, says uh, Peter and Bruce, indeed, Kyrgyzstan is no stranger to uh, having seen their presidents flee uh, from office. As a matter of fact, this is the third time the country's citizens have forced their presidents to flee after 2005 and 2010. So uh, 10 years of somewhat stability are now uh, out of the window? Well, you know, I mean, relative stability, I think you put that correctly. Uh, it's there, you know, the politics in the country is always kind of volatile and, and so difficult sometimes to say exactly what will set this off. Um, you know, that said, uh, they always do seem to come back. I mean, uh, the difference, you know, Peter was, you were asking Peter about the is Kyrgyzstan the only democracy? People have, are much more politicized in Kyrgyzstan, and civil society is much more active in Kyrgyzstan, too. So there are, there are issues that can come up that can trigger these kind of things. In this case, it was elections, uh, you know, but uh, and that's why I kind of have a feeling that we're not quite done yet with the, with what's going on, um, just because there's a lot of people that are dissatisfied. Uh, you know, the reason they came out to protest on October 5th. Uh, was, you know, against corruption in the government and, and for change in politics and change in the officials. Uh, and instead, what they ended up with was their, uh, you know, their, their protest and, and the gains they made were hijacked instantly. So, um, you know, I would imagine that uh, right now everyone's sitting back and trying to figure out what all this means. But uh, I, I certainly wouldn't think that this was the end of it, although it already has been drawn out a little bit, uh, a little bit longer than I would have expected. So, Joanna, then, could this be interpreted in a positive way, that Kyrgyzstan has a healthy, vibrant, and very attentive civil society? I think um, on, on uh, Monday, the 5th of October, <clears throat> when protesters took to the streets in protest um, at um, those very skewed election results that were, had been delivered by, by vote-buying, um, then we could have interpreted 
it as a victory for healthy democracy. But Bruce mentioned the word hijacked, and I think what we have seen since then is this movement, which was just a disparate movement of opposition parties and all parties shut out of, of parliament, it wasn't really a movement of itself, um, has been seriously hijacked by uh, people uh, who, you know, are close to a person who was sprung from jail, a convicted criminal who was sprung from jail during those protests. Hijacked is the word, and I don't think when, um, you know, when a convicted criminal is holding the country over a barrel, sending his supporters out to not only pressure, but also uh, physically attack rival politicians. One, one contender for prime minister was knocked unconscious with a stone. The former president, who was also released from jail during all this unrest, was shot at. Um, now, the prime minister, Sadeh uh, Japarov, says that um, the former president arranged that attack upon himself. Now, none of this looks like a victory. None of this looks like a healthy um, democratic system. On the contrary, it looks like a hijack by very shadowy forces of a disputed electoral process. So a turn for the a worse, turn for the negative then. I indeed, Peter, uh, Kyrgyzstan and the aftermath of the election are now being watched by the entire world, but by one country in particular, of course, and that is Russia, uh, Kyrgyzstan's most uh, strategic ally in terms of economy and security. And we know that Vladimir Putin had just sent a very high-ranking envoy to Bishkek. Uh, what do we know about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so what we know is that uh, on uh, uh, Monday, Dmitry Kozak, uh, a uh, uh, plenipotentiary for um, uh, President Putin, travelled to Kyrgyzstan. He met with the president and he met with the now uh, prime minister. Uh, what the exact details of the conversation was, we don't know, but uh, we have to assume, given uh, developments that flowed out of that, that um, uh, this was an attempt to broker some kind of uh, truce between, between the sides. Um, you're right to say that um, Russia and uh, Kyrgyzstan are indeed extremely close, and their closeness isn't just contingent on a uh, strategic alliance. There's also a very strong uh, economic dependence that Kyrgyzstan has on Russia. Um, hundreds of thousands of Kyrgyz citizens go to uh, work and live in, 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 uh, in Russia, and, uh, and the Kyrgyz economy, about one third of it, is accounted for by the money that these laborers uh, send back from Russia. So the, the, the level of dependence is very intense indeed, and so anything that the Kremlin says is always very uh, attentively listened to in Kyrgyzstan. Bruce, does Russia have a role in the current upheaval in Kyrgyzstan? Whom is Moscow rooting for here in this particular context? I'm sorry, could you repeat that uh, again? I'm sorry. No, no problem. I, I was well, wondering I if Russia has an active role in the current upheavals that we're seeing in Kyrgyzstan, and if so, whom is Moscow rooting for in this particular conflict? No, I wouldn't say that Russia has a role in this at all. Uh, you know, you pointed out they've had two revolutions in Kyrgyzstan already. Uh, protests are, are far from being, uh, you know, uh, some strange event to the people in Kyrgyzstan. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, what for the the reasons that Peter just mentioned, you know, not to, not to also forget that Russia has a military base there and are seen as the ultimate, uh, you know, guarantors of security in the region. Um, that that Russia will all, understands the Kremlin understands that it will always have a role in Kyrgyzstan. It, it's difficult to imagine that Kyrgyzstan could in any way really separate itself from Russia at this particular moment. It's not in Russia's interest that there's unrest in Kyrgyzstan. They don't want it, unrest in Kyrgyzstan. They don't want unrest to spread from Kyrgyzstan to any of the neighboring countries, which of course also are in the CIS: uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. Um, so, you know, it would, it's difficult to believe that Russia would have any active role in this. Now, as far as trying to mediate uh, some kind of settlement after this, certainly, because they, have a, their, they carry a lot of weight in Kyrgyzstan, and ultimately anyone who, who emerges on top is going to have to deal with Russia, you know, again, uh, because of re for remittances that the Kyrgyz send back, because of oil that Russia sends to Kyrgyzstan, uh, Ga Gazprom owns the gas network in Kyrgyzstan. You know, I mean, it go the list goes on and on. So, um, you know, I, I, the Kremlin doesn't need to interfere with that. In fact, they warned, specifically warned 
uh, last year when uh, former President Atambayev went to Moscow in July last year that they didn't want to see another revolution in Kyrgyzstan and they didn't want any more instability. That said, it happened. But like I said, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think they're confident in the Kremlin that whoever whoever emerges in power will be calling Moscow for advice and help. Well, let's look ahead then, Joanna. You are in Kyrgyzstan, a country you know well, a region you know well. Uh, how do you foresee this uh, is going to play out? Well, it's really very unpredictable. Um, um, the fact that um, really just within the last couple of hours, we have heard that the, the, the two, the president and the prime minister, cannot agree on the future. Um, there is no clear uh, pact between them, despite um, Sadi Japarov being installed as prime minister. Um, you know, the fact that he's now pushing uh, the president to go makes things very uncertain. The fact that his supporters have been out on the streets um, um, and, uh, you know, are rallied today and are, are promising to rally again tomorrow gives him muscle um, to, to enforce what he wants. Um, but it's also very unpredictable what happens. Um, so if he resigns, if he doesn't resign, whether uh, someone will try to use violence to make him do so. Um, if he does agree to resign, it's also a very unpredictable situation. Um, by law, the um, acting presidency, until new elections are held, would go to the Speaker of Parliament, who's only just been him installed himself. Um, but uh, if there were no Speaker of Parliament, as there wasn't until just a couple of days ago, the acting presidency would actually move uh, to the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister, of, co of course, is um, Sadi Japarov. So we're in a very, very um, uncertain situation. Um, and uh, it, it really, it's, it's a question of getting the crystal ball out tonight um, and seeing how things pan out tomorrow and um, whether a peaceful solution can be found for Kyrgyzstan. An uncertain, if not volatile, situation still might await uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, Peter, how do you think this is uh, going to play out? Could this perhaps even escalate uh, any further? Well, uh, the, the one thing I would um, draw people's attention to is that um, Kyrgyzstan is one of those countries because it's so economic, economically vulnerable in, in any event. Uh, it has taken a particularly heavy hit as a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, some estimates have it uh, uh, having 10% wiped off its economy this year. Um, it's now entering uh, its second wave of uh, a coronavirus outbreak and its healthcare system is, is uh, uh, you know, barely um, equipped uh, to cope with its uh, normal uh, caseloads, uh, let alone uh, this uh, pandemic. And against that backdrop to have um, a prime minister, you were asking about him earlier, I mean, this is a man with no significant uh, experience of um, governing anything at all. I mean, he has extremely minimal gov go governing experience. Um, you know, I think he's going to be making it up on the fly pretty much as he goes along. Um, he's being directed by heavens only knows what sort of uh, uh, shadowy kind of semi-criminal kind of uh, uh, or completely criminal uh, elements behind him. Uh, none of this um, makes for a very comforting picture as to to precisely what will happen, I can't say, but I, that it will be bad, I think, is uh, um, probably a safe bet. Bruce, uh, let's also get your prediction in here, how you foresee this uh, is going to play out in Kyrgyzstan. I don't see any happy endings coming anytime soon, that's for sure. Um, you know, I mean, in some ways, the ball is in the opposition court right now. Uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the thugs that have have come out in support of Saparov have have managed to keep the opposition from being able to meet in the capital and and there is an emergency situation you're not supposed to be able to hold any kind of demonstrations or protests in the capital anyway uh, you know again Kyrgyzstan has shown in the past that that opposition arises to these uh, in these situations um, and they can gather a lot of supporters very very quickly so. Uh, I know there's a lot of unhappy people out there uh, at the turn of events in the country. Uh, a lot of people are dissatisfied with the way that this is going. You know, and, and uh, as was mentioned, I mean, Saparov is not, he, he was never a major political figure at all. Uh, you know, his support base is in is in the northeastern Issyk-Kul province. Um, and that's also where he took the hostage, by the way, too. And he's a one-topic guy. Uh, you know, he was against, he wanted the nationalization of this big gold mine up there. 
So he really it just seems to me like himself a transitional figure, uh, you know, and um, and I can't believe he's going to be able to rally mass support behind him, whereas the dissatisfaction is is huge in the country, uh, not only against him, but against the whole process that led to him getting to be prime minister and the fact that, uh, you know, the, the elections were unfair and uh, officials seemed to turn a blind eye to during the campaigning to what they knew was going to happen and you know on election day so uh like i said i just can't it's not over uh and i can't see anything good coming in the near future possibly not a happy ending in kyrgyzstan says bruce Pena. thank you to him but also joanna lillis and peter leonard of course for shedding lights uh, on uh, the very complicated situation in kyrgyzstan and uh, and helping us understand the situation there on the ground and thank you out there for watching, of course. Hope to see you again next time when we're back with a new edition of Newsmakers.